Hello, everyone. Hi out there. And yes, Bristol, we are here. We see you're already in the chat room asking after us. Thank you for coming by. Welcome to the Musical Porn Stream with Glenn and Bree. I am Glenn. And I'm Bree. And today we are uh, going to be talking about musical theater as soon as I get our feedback turned off here. Here we go. All right. We're going to be talking about musical theater in this particular episode, like we have every episode since <laughs> That's what I was March. Say, I was like, <laughs> but just in this one. Just All in the this other one. ones, if you ever like, you know, went back in time, mm -hmm. those are not about musical theater. <laughs> yes, the musical Quarren Stream turns out not a show about musicals. It's actually a show about like 1950s era professional wrestling. Uh, mm -hmm. So on that note. Well, it looks like we're having a bit of a picture problem, maybe. Oh, okay. So Bristol is saying they've got sound, but they have a dark screen. Uh, well, we are we're seeing our feed on our television monitor here, which is hooked into the internet. Well, we also know we've been having kind of these unprecedented thunderstorms. Um, right around mm -hmm. six thirty, we had a flash flood warning. So it could be our connection. It could be um, the weather. Um, we're not necessarily sure what's going on. Um, hmm. we, we suggest maybe logging off and logging back on again from your side. And uh, if that doesn't fix it, then we might have to try that ourselves. Yes. But uh, let's see. This is probably operator malfunction there. Mm -hmm. All right. But uh, yeah, our weather has been a bit nuts the past couple of days. In fact, uh, the area is under a flash flood warning. Yeah, and yeah. we had a um, tornado last week. Yeah, so, so. Let's see. All sorts of fun stuff happening around here. Yeah. Uh, the, it was flash flood warning. Mm -hmm. Yep. Flash flood warning until 1030 tonight. So. so don't go driving out there if you're in Central Virginia. Yes. Stay home, stay safe. I, I think we'll be all right up here. We, we are. On the second level. Yeah, we're on the second <laughs> floor. So Theoret theoretically, we are above the floodplain. All right. Dep depend on what type of proportions. Biblical? <laughs> if it's biblical, we got worse problems headed our way. You know? well, we save the kittens. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, so we have done this show twice a week ever since March. With a few exceptions. We've yeah. had a few weeks off um, due to health reasons on my part and also in support of Black Lives Matter um, mm -hmm. and an attempt to give voice to black creators on this platform. Yes. But in general, we're here twice a week to talk about musical theater and theater in general, the arts in general. Yay. Um, and for most of that time, our main feature every episode has been that we pitch our ideas for our, for our shows. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, let's let's start off with uh, the fun stuff. Uh, what have we seen that we want to tell people about? Um, I have really been getting into the brain scoop with Dr. Emily Grasley. I saw her on the prehistoric road trip, which happened last month or a couple months ago. Um, she is a scientist that does like a little uh, vlog for the Field Museum in Chicago. And I've been to Chicago a lot um, to see friends and to see theater, but I don't think I've been to the Field Museum. And so that's kind of like, next time I can get to Chicago, <laughs> I'm gonna visit all my friends, I'm gonna see everybody's theatrical performances, and then I definitely wanna go hang out and go to the Field Museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been watching that, I really liked it. I've been trying to get Glenn into it. He's yeah. really liked it as well. Um, I've basically been kind of getting into all of the PBS digital shorts and stuff like that. Um, it started with kind of a foray into Storied, which is about myths and monsters, and kind of like bled into um, It's Okay to Be Smart, Smart and eons and um, a lot of other that type of material it's all on YouTube um, I really enjoy that quite a bit mm. um, I also saw this is like my big revelation so um, one of my favorite uh, shows that happened within the past few years has been be more chill and um, I started seeing a bunch of like performances pop up on YouTube and I was like wait the, are people just like 
we all went and we saw it 16 times and now we're going to do it at our high school and like that's really weird but um apparently the rights came out oh. <laughs> so there were a lot of performances that are now kind of going up to basically be like hey there's no more theater because of coronavirus but here you can watch this production i really like it um also i think that um from what i saw as a quick tweet today or <laughs> when i looked at over lunch was uh, Joe Iconis is trying to figure out how to get a cast recording of Love and Hate Nation. Oh, Which yeah. I really, really like that show as well. Um, my two favorite songs. I mean, you can't find many of the songs on YouTube because it's only had one production at Two River Theater in New Jersey. But um, they have recordings of Oh Well which is a great song, mm -hmm. and Revolution in the Institution, the Revolution song, those are really good. So I was kind of like hoping that they would release something like that. Um, I think kind of another one that I want to be promoting as well, kind of in this recent Joy Goddess trifecta, <laughs> is uh, Broadway Bounty Hunter, starring uh, Broadway veteran Annie Golden. And okay. I, that's like, I think $11 on like Apple iTunes, if you're looking for something, it's basically taking those, um, exploitation films of the seventies and turning it into a, you know, aging Broadway star, um, <laughs> needs to find another career. So of course she now becomes a bounty hunter. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. It's a lot of fun. That's kind of what I've been digging lately. How about you? Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I've been watching a lot more movies, trying to like, gather some material for uh, the film Optimist, which is I'm gearing up to produce more episodes of that. Um, just today, watched a very interesting movie that Brie actually, like, she's the one who told me about it. Even though I hate um, horror movies. I was yes. like, you have to watch this horror movie. Well, well and that <laughs> is the thing. Brie hears about interesting horror movies that might actually slip past me, might fly under my radar which is an interesting thing because I am the horror fan. She is not. <laughs> Although but, we went to Starbucks and they did ask you what was yeah. your favorite horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I had to tell them, I was like, oh, it's a boring answer, but I, I'm a big fan of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And they're like, no, that's not a boring answer. Those are good movies. So they... Thumbs up to the Starbucks fault. Yeah, we. I mean, I'll be honest. This was the Starbucks I tried to work at for a while, so we're already slightly biased. Um, yeah. We think they're great. Um, it has been the one place that I feel really safe going to as far as like a drive through mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Um, the other thing I can, and I'll let yeah. you get back to your horror movie rant. The other things I've really liked so far, which I'll just say like big thumbs up, is if you you shipped. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't an ad. I'm not getting paid by shipped, but I've used them three times. I like them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. I just think it's really hard nowadays to go out and go shopping. It increases my stress. It increases my blood pressure. So I think I've kind of caved and we've done a lot of Wegmans delivery or Wegmans pickup. We've done shipped. And then, of course, being able to go to Starbucks and have a little, you know, treat on the days I have to be at the hospital at 7. Yeah. So, so, but back to Glenn's horror movie. <laughs> so, yeah, Brie told me, you actually told me this morning <laughs> uh, about there's a, a movie. It's uh, exclusive on Shudder, uh, Shudder.tv, S-H-U-D-D-E-R, you know, like <laughs> Shudder, um, which is a horror-based streaming service that I just happen to have a subscription to because I subscribe to them. I bought a year-long subscription like nine months ago, I think, because they are also the home of Joe Bob Briggs in The Last Drive-In. Um, <clears throat> but they've just put up a movie called Host, which is a very interesting piece. It's the second movie that I've heard of uh, to come out since the pandemic started that is filmed entirely using teleconferencing software so all of the actors are basically in their own home or wherever they were quarantining at the time of shooting uh it's all filmed through like webcams and phone cameras and things like that and in this case i believe uh Bree knows more about the actual story behind the movie than i do but i believe it was genuinely all filmed as a zoom call so it's yeah. not edited together to look like a Zoom call. 
it is a Zoom call that they filmed and edited. Yeah, I think, um, like, the reason why I kind of heard about it is, I guess, like, a, a headline kind of came across my news feed or mm -hmm. something. And I remember hearing about a horror movie <clears throat> that happened in June with a yeah. lot of YouTube personalities. And I thought, oh, maybe this is the same thing. I'll read about mm -hmm. it. And it was actually a different thing. Yeah, it was a different one. This one has a, uh, a British cast. It's all British actors. And um, mostly... Uh, Mostly female cast, mm -hmm. and it's uh, basically a group of friends who decide that, hey, you know, for their, like, Zoom get-together night sort of thing, they're going to hire a psychic to lead them through a seance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, hi! And uh, the seance goes wrong, and another uh, a sort of, like, malicious spirit comes through instead and it's a really interesting movie it's only about uh it's under an hour long it's like 56 minutes long yep and, um but i thought it sounded interesting and i said yeah. like what do you have to lose it's 56 minutes if you yeah. hate it so what it was, it was and, and it's still it, it's a form th this sort of form is something that they're not the first to experiment with it like we said there was the one that came out uh, earlier with Zach Kornfeld from the Try Guys in it. Um, there's also the Unfriended series, which is two movies at this point. Uh, that's a similar idea where you're watching someone's computer screen mm -hmm. while they're using Skype and everything to talk to people. What was the um, movie with John Cho? Oh, um... Something. It was another one like this. Yeah, it was another I was one like, like it's this. It's like Taken, but John Cho and the internet. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting format that's coming up. Uh, I think that... I haven't seen the one that Zach Kornfeld was in. The impression I got of it, though is that it's more of a slasher comedy, sort of a parody of slasher and I think films. it was only like a two ninety nine rental or something when you look yeah. at it. <clears throat> um, but uh, the host is probably, unlike a lot of critics out there who have seen these movies, uh, like the Unfriended series has gotten pretty much universally bad reviews from professional film critics. I actually like those movies. I think that... Film critics have a problem with the format of looking at the computer screen. And I think it's an interesting direction that we're going in terms of telling realistic stories. Um, and Host works really well. I told Brie when I picked her up from work today, I told her that I had watched the movie and I said, you know what? I said, this was a movie made by actors in quarantine. Mm -hmm. I was like, there were, there were special effects in this movie. There were stunts in this movie. They had like six stunt coordinators in the credits. I'm like, that's really impressive. They had practical effects. Like there's, uh, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, but there is a scene where a character who is sitting at their desk, uh, the chair that they're sitting on, which is a chair like the ones we're currently sitting on. It's like a, it's like a dining room chair, but the chair that she's sitting on just suddenly slides all the way across the room from the computer. And it is, it's a very well done effect. And I looked at that and I was like, they had to talk an actor through setting up that special effect in their home so they could get that shot that they needed. That's pretty phenomenal. And uh, so it's, it's a level of creativity and problem solving and finding ways to tell stories, especially now that the quarantine is going on, especially now that people are social distancing and having to stay home. Uh, yeah, I was uh, telling Glenn, I said, for the Film Optimist, who, you mm -hmm. know, if you're watching us on YouTube, we're under the Film Optimist channel, and you do have some new content coming your way. Mm -hmm. It's not all going to be musical corn stream. Yeah. But I told Glenn he should really do something about the the rise or the era of Zoomies. Yeah, I, and I think that's the perfect term for it. It's, you know, it's going to be like silent films and soundies and, and talkies. Yeah. Talkies and <laughs> and here's, here's going to be the Zoomies, you know, the movies that actors make. I can see this being a form of film that actors are going to make when they're between jobs. Yeah. Uh, a lot like... Um, like back the, with the writer's strike. Yeah. During the writer's strike or the uh, 
the Much Ado About Nothing that was made between the Avengers films. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can, I can see these sorts of things where you're going to have creative writers, directors, multi-hyphenates. You know, I could see Robert Downey Jr. deciding he's going to do one of these movies or something. Yeah, and I think it's going to be really exciting when they move beyond things that have been usually uh, low cost and high reward, mm -hmm. like horror movies, into uh, maybe more things like, you know, serious dramas or uh, comedies. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I was watching something today about artificial intelligence and virtual mm -hmm. reality and how uh, sometimes we as humans have a hard time if we have a negative experience with it first, that then we swear off of it forever, which is why it's, it's so hard to uh, maybe get good Oculus material or stuff like yeah. that and they're talking about like you know that's gonna be really important i think that that's probably what's going to maybe push people towards doing zoomies yeah is you see stuff like host mm -hmm. and you're like oh this is doable i could do this and yeah. i could do it in this genre and i can do that and i think that especially with uh with this maybe being around for a very long time or maybe trying to uh figure out ways that young people can enter the field without, yeah. you know, having to move out to LA or New York or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it, it's kind of the first ray of optimism that we might have kind of had about the entertainment industry. I think figuring out how to monetize it and get people paid, that's going to be much harder. And of course, if you're not working under a uh, industry umbrella, like a movie studio, I think that's going to be kind of hard, but you know, it's not, not impossible. I think we kind of need to figure out a way to Mm -hmm. get the economy back up and people staying safe and i think that if if people are creating these zoomies and able to monetize them and yeah. not make it too punitive to folks who are, are out of work or having a hard time well, like how after the great depression they could sell movie tickets for a nickel you know like maybe this is the way to do it yeah and You'll have a much are, low overhead there are things going on right now where i'm not entirely certain what direction the entertainment industry is going to go in whether it's a good direction or a bad direction are you but a I know. good witch or a bad witch? But, but I know, for instance, a movie like The Host, like Host, it, it, it is a movie that, generally speaking, there are tons of independent productions every year. Only about maybe 10% of those productions actually make it to a finished product. Some of them fall off in pre-production, some of them fall apart in the shooting, some, the director gets to a certain point where they're like, I don't have the ability to finish editing this movie. You know, some too much is missing or something like that. Um, so that handful of movies then sort of fights for recognition. And part of that recognition is distribution. It's very difficult to get distribution, but if you get, generally speaking, if you have a completed independent film, if you can get it to a film market, somebody's going to distribute it. Now, it might be uh, one of these companies that, as they like to say, shows up on the last day of the film market, walks around the booths, and they the way they describe it is they buy horror movies by the pound. It's basically like, you got a horror movie? Uh, we'll give you 20000 bucks and we'll put it out on DVD. It's like it's a drop in the bucket for their budget. And the person who sells their movie is probably never going to see another dime from it. Um, but now you will have Amazon has opened up their Prime streaming service so that you can sign up if you have an Amazon account and just upload video to Amazon and it will become part of the Amazon Prime streaming service. Mm -hmm. And then they pay you for every minute that people watch of your video. Um, obviously not a whole lot. Otherwise, it'd be really easy for them to just go bankrupt, even with the billions that Amazon has. But I look at something like that, and I'm like, well, that's opening up to everybody who has an idea that doesn't have the money to make it a thing that one of these companies, like Mill Creek Entertainment or something, would be willing to pay $20,000 for, now they've got an outlet. Now we have truly democratic film distribution. On the other hand, I look at that and I go, well, yeah, but the people who finish their movies could be like, at least somebody out there is going to pay me 20000 bucks for it. And now you don't even have that. It's like, well, I'll put it up on Amazon and maybe if I'm lucky by the end of the year, 
I'll have $500 worth of views. I don't know. I think there definitely has to be some sort of restructuring with especially all the streaming services. Mm -hmm. is you can definitely get eyes on stuff, especially without having a movie theater to go to, mm -hmm. really. But yeah, I don't know. I think people need to start thinking creatively. It's like what we talk about a lot with like politics is like mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of change and a lot of protesting. But until you kind of get you know, intelligent people who can really kind of enact it. Yeah. It's sometimes really, really hard. And especially like in the cases like money talks, yeah. you know, it's like, yes, I have, you know, millions of people who don't want this, but I do yeah. have a million dollars from this <laughs> lobbyist. Well, and to tie this story into musicals, which this is the musical <laughs> chorus string. Uh, I remember the story of, and you're familiar with this movie, even though you're not a horror fan, mm -hmm. Cannibal the Musical. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a very funny movie, uh, front-loaded with a lot of blood, but not a whole lot of blood and gore throughout. Uh, but it's basically a musical about the Donner Party, mm -hmm. um, created, made by the people who created South Park mm -hmm. before they created South Park. And I remember their story about they took it around, and literally every distributor they showed it to, including the ones who buy horror movies by the pound, mm -hmm. Uh, looked at it and was like, wow, this is a great movie. We really like this movie you've made. We think this movie you've made is going to be really popular with an audience. And as soon as you sell it to somebody else, you're going to be happy. And then you should come and show us your second movie. And like nobody was buying. And then finally Lloyd Kaufman from Troma contacted them and he's like, hey, I saw you guys are in town. I'm in town too. You want to go to Del Taco and discuss your movie? <laughs> and like, they were like, sure, we'll go to Del Taco. And then they sh showed up. They wound up paying for the entire meal because they offered sort of politically. And Lloyd Kaufman was like, yes. <laughs> and I want extra guacamole too. And then he sat down and told them, you know, your movie is great. We really think we'd like to distribute it at Troma. And they said, great. How, uh, what were you thinking of? for like compensation and he says well we thought we'd design you a nice video box cover and maybe put a cardboard standee in a couple of rental shops and if we're really lucky by the end of five years we'll have made back all of the money we spent putting your movie out and that was they were like that was the moment that they realized they were never going to get paid for this movie from anybody. So they might as well just let him release it. <laughs> well, this is also like politics, like we were talking about earlier. It's like there's a lot of uh, people who, well, I don't want to say what I really want. And I don't want to support the mm -hmm. thing I really want. But if everybody else does it, then I'll do it. <laughs> yes. So. But anyway, so. Well, this is the political issue day. So, yes, of course, we are, we are, you know, thinking at the forefront and there's a lot of things going on. Mm. And, um, you know, we kind of touched, introduced this idea of social topics last week. Uh, we dealt with kind of like broader things. But I think for this week, like my topic in particular that we're going to be talking about today uh, was really based on a specific story. And to be honest, like. That's kind of like where a lot of my processes come from is like things that I think are really interesting and like why haven't I seen that story before. Mm -hmm. So like I think um, a couple of things that we talked about seeing on these PBS digital shorts is there was like, oh gosh, what was that lady with the the saint with the Ammonites? Oh, um... Anyway, there's like this saint um, in England who was supposed to like build a chapel and um basically the mythology around it was she cursed snakes into stone and then tossed them off the cliffs yes. and that's why you found so many ammonites like <laughs> fossils around there and i thought well that's great why haven't i seen that movie why haven't i seen that yeah. play like i'd love to see like this like no 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 it's just fossils <laughs> okay fine snakes <laughs> <laughs> um and i think like of course like you know as as a woman Mm -hmm. um you know i want to see see parts i can play yeah you know i i like to see parts from it I like to see parts that are fun um the other one that we came across was the flapper and the panda which yeah. i was like if that is not a miss fisher episode i don't know why not <laughs> just about uh the lady who brought the first live panda over from china to america yeah. which is really neat actually they said wasn't she like the first woman first person 
in like the Western world mm-hmm. to bring back a panda alive from China. Yeah. And like the funny thing was, as I told Glenn this in the recap before I made him watch it, was like, and she was invited to the Explorers Club, but not because she was an explorer and brought back this panda, but because the panda was invited for an interview and she was the panda's plus one. Yes. Because <laughs> sexism. <laughs> she was she was officially a guest of Su Lin the Panda at the Explorers Club, yes. So it's like stuff like that. Like I, I tend to come across stories that I find are really interesting and then I just like file this away in like mm-hmm. little story brain and think, oh, somebody should write about that. Yeah. Little do I know this, this somebody's going to eventually have to be me. And uh, this kind of came about in the same way, but not as, as jovial as my past two examples. It's a very serious issue and something that... Um, I've talked about a lot. Um, My family, you know, are immigrants to this country fairly recently. Um, I'm really kind of fortunate that I'm, you know, middle class white lady. But, um, you know, I kind of think about, you know, I was talking to my mom about this. You know, they they were here in the Great Depression and they were, you know, foreigners and outsiders and not native English speakers um, and uh, you know, blue collar, you know, trying to make a living here. Um, and if it wasn't for the wealth that they had been able to accumulate in their lifetime and my mother and my father have been able to accumulate in in their lifetime, you know, we would be in the same position to be a hundred percent honest. Like, you know, if I did not have family members who did well between the last great depression and this great depression, um, I'd be living very similarly, Mm -hmm. you know, like I, I realized that as a, you know, white person that's had certain advantages and probably because of systematic, like racist policies, um, you know, I have a roof over my head that I don't have to worry about being evicted from. I mean, I think my job is fairly secure because of the education that I've had, um, you know, and if, if my job's not secure, I think I have an easier time at getting another job. Like, um, not that, you know, things don't happen to everybody, but I do think that a lot of my advantages have been because of, you know, who my lineage is. But I think that that's also why, like, I don't know who fought for my grandparents, um, as immigrants, but I feel like they, you, well, first of all, I'd not be speaking English. Um, you know, my, mm-hmm. my mom's side is kind of from Czechoslovakia, which is like no longer in existence and like Yugoslavia, which is no longer in existence. So we, we might not even, I might not even be here. Like we might be dead cause of war. Um, so I, I think that as, as somebody who realizes how privileged they are with that, I, I really have a big stake in the immigrant issue. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think it's right for my, my grandparents to flee war and to flee persecution and come here and be afforded so many opportunities and then that door be shut to anybody else. I think that that was a big, you know, story of America that I was told and I really want to believe that it's true and I think that, you know, I, I have, I, (laughs) I have through my background that I believe that humans have the power to create heaven or hell on earth for each other. And I think that because we are smart and because we care about each other, we should always strive to create that heaven on earth. Right. So, I mean, I think for me, the immigration issue is, is very, very personal. And, uh, I, I always feel really, you know, lucky that, you know, I, I, well, first of all, got to be like, you know, second generation American because I could get B's and not A's. But <laughs> but also because like I, I get to have like a different perspective on what it means to be an American because I know that there are some people's families that have been here for 400 years. Like mm-hmm. my best friend, uh, Kelly, her family has been here since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And that's a different experience than, you know, people who immigrated here at the turn of the last century. Um, it's both makes us Americans, though, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that that's what's really kind of like nice and special and I think that we should afford that to all immigrants because I think that some of the best ideas that we've gotten in this country and advanced as a society and a nation and has had some of our greatest discoveries and smartest insights have been because of the creativity that diversity and immigrants have brought to us Mm -hmm. and like we're really lucky we're really lucky that we have so many immigrants that want to be here (laughs) you know it's like it's the best gross national product you Mm -hmm. know that we have so I, uh, I also grew up in Texas, so, <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, I tried to find the original article. I didn't save it, but like I, I, I don't, 
Okay, writers, this is not a great strategy. If you have a better strategy, please tweet at me mm -hmm. um, or make a message in the comments. But this is my strategy, and you'll see why it's not great. On the one hand, I don't mind it because it means that I can kind of like be a little more creative and I can work from a place of emotion, which I think is sometimes really good at art. On the other hand, it's not a really good look for a debate. <laughs> a really good look of like my facts and figures and my science side of the brain. So I'll normally write down like, here is this key phrase that I can use a touchstone and come back to this material. Yeah. And uh, the one thing that stuck out to me was 6,000 children. So when I type back in crisis at the U.S.-Mexican border and 6,000 children, I found this uh, article from The Independent um, that was published in June of 2018, which I think sounds about right. Um, essentially saying because of the concentration camps at the border and the separation of the children and the parents, um, there have been... And this was just for the past two years. 6,000 children lost at the U.S.-Mexican border. Some people, uh, well, they were saying they ran away. Um, they were human trafficked. Um, they were surreptitiously adopted. You know, it's just really staggering. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it was kind of the first big number we heard out of this administration that just seemed like mind-boggling. Like, now we're... Now we're at almost like 170,000 deaths, yeah, which is far surpassing this, but it is all huge human rights travesties. And, you know, I, I just keep thinking if I was in any other country and I heard that this was going on, I would be terrified. I would not want to come to the United States. They're losing people's kids. Mm -hmm. They're killing their own people. And like, I just, I never... And this is probably my, my privilege here, but I never thought that that would happen. I always yeah. thought to some extent it was always, you know, us versus the world and an American life lost is an American life lost. No American life should be lost. And um, I feel like it always seems a bit weird at whose lives do people choose to say matter? <laughs> because I, I feel like, you know, I'm, you know, full disclosure, if you watch the show, I, I definitely believe in a woman's right to choose and having your own bodily autonomy. But like, I also believe like children shouldn't be dying or going missing. Um, you know, people should not be turned back when they're seeking asylum. We should not say like, it is okay for children and elderly people to die just so that people who have money should keep their money. And um, this this story that I was hoping to kind of adapt to the stage um, was with that striking number, that 6,000 mm -hmm. children. Um, I think too often in musical theater, when we think of kids on stage, um, what does that conjure for you, Glenn Williams? When I think of kids <laughs> on stage, I think of Annie, I think of Matilda, I think a basically adorable little mop top yeah. singing, you know, bright songs about life as a yeah. kid. But you think it's like positive people are like, yeah, go, go see kids on stage. Yeah. 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 I mean, because I, I mean, I, I think I've had a unique experience. I've been a kid mm -hmm. on stage. I've taught kids on stage. Um, I, I think unless your parents or friends or something, like not too many people are super mm -hmm. excited about seeing kids on stage. Oh, they're whiny. Oh, they're hard to work with. Blah, blah, blah. But I think most of the time when I've taught kids, um, I, I think kids have so much more intelligence and um, thought about the world than we get them credit for, especially theater kids who feel a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I think that it would be very possible to have kids play real issues and mm. talk about real things. And um, I'm not saying that Annie doesn't deal with things that are serious, like being an orphan and being right. poor. You know, those are certainly things that you can deal with, but I feel like... You know, it just from the flip of a coin or the, mm -hmm. you know, stability of fate or good luck or whatever, you know, you can have, you know, eight to 18 year old kids playing kids and yeah. showcase the diversity of like what America is. And I just thought, you know, this would be a really amazing opportunity to mm -hmm. do some of like my favorite theater, which is things like um, Fires in the Mirror yeah. and do that kind of like really serious reporting, but involve the people who are going to change their, you know, 
generation and vote and mm -hmm. care. And I think that kids do care about this. I think that this is why kids are, are scared about a lot of things because I think they see that things are going on. I remember as a little kid being very very scared about the environment and mm -hmm. you know i was talking to my mom like the past three years have been the hottest years on records like it's still a thing to be scared of um i was very fortunate that i got to be part of a book when i was a little kid called mm -hmm. where would we sleep by lannis temple and the funding went to unicef um but i had some pictures in it and all of my things are like picture of the earth and i wish people loved me oh. <laughs> and like a picture of a deer head over somebody's mantle would be like i wish i was alive oh. <laughs> so that was the type of little kid i was and i know that there are other little kids out there mm. that are also like that and i feel like i want to write a piece that kids can do and mm -hmm. i think that a good example of this type of work is being done by the albany park theater company and they're in chicago speaking a lot about chicago mm -hmm. today um and they do that type of stuff they go into kids and they say what do you think is really important and uh, they do topics that are fairly serious and that kids want to talk about and kids want to create theater about and i think that that's the best way to kind of work into serious pieces of theater I also think that there's a lot of beautiful songs that can kind of yeah. come out of it. So it's just something that I was really thinking about very seriously as something that could be made for kids by kids in a very serious way that could get a lot of serious attention. It wouldn't just be a mm. um, vanity project for somebody's stage mom. You yeah. know, it wouldn't just be how cute does somebody look as Matilda or Annie. It would definitely be something that I think kids can deal with. And I think that by making it, you know, with kids, um, we really we can't have a lot of empathy until we see physical kids in front of us sometimes. Um, and until we can kind of relate like those kids are our kids, <laughs> which is horrible. But you know, it's like, I think you just hear these big numbers. You hear 6,000, you hear 170,000. That just seems so insurmountable. And that just right. seems like almost unreal. And in fact, like, you know, I've heard from some of my family members, like, I think I just invented the whole coronavirus because I don't know anybody that's sick. Well, we're also all, like privileged yeah. <laughs> we also have been staying inside we've also not had to go into work if we didn't really have to mm -hmm. and i think that um putting a face with a name or of course having a song i think all these things are are going to be really great and um you know they don't all have to be castle on a cloud <laughs> no <laughs> well and you know i i think it's I think it's great. Like you, like you mentioned, Annie deals with very uh, serious topics, mm -hmm. although largely Annie deals with them in a very cheerful, hummable way. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, there have been shows like uh, I think Fun Home mm -hmm. gave yeah. an opportunity to young actresses to play some very serious uh, issues. Um, although that I look at a show like that and I say that's one to three children in the show at a given time uh, playing playing those serious situations. And the idea of, I, I like the idea of a collaborative piece made with children mm -hmm. about an issue this serious mm -hmm. and i also like the idea of like maybe you don't ever get you know eight to 14 year olds doing it mm -hmm. um, maybe it's just 14 to 18 year olds doing it but how often from between mm -hmm. you and i have we done a musical in high school and we're like well you're playing somebody who's 45 <laughs> but just understand it okay yes. or you're playing a grandmother mm -hmm. but just do it i know you're 16 but pretend you're 88 yes. <laughs> and i kind of like the idea of you know a, a, an 18 year old is still closer to a 10 year old than an 88 year old yeah. so you know even if you're having older kids in high school or college doing a production like this because it is too hard on younger kids classroom time or you know family time or whatever else although i think you could probably do it if it yeah. was like you know worth the right investment because of course they made matilda have to with a lot of kids right. but 
Um, even if you did it with older kids. Yeah. I still think that that is something that especially high schoolers who are looking at going into college, becoming an adult for the first time, voting for the first time, all that mm -hmm. stuff, would still want to talk about and still want to do. And I could certainly see like a 14-year-old playing a 10-year-old, you know? Yeah. I, um, I could see that. I could see this as a show that professional productions, you want to go for a child cast. Um, in that range of, say, 10 to 14 years old. And then in terms of spreading it out into community theaters and high schools and colleges, being like, our focus on this show is younger actors. You know, so this is a show that we market to, uh, and I say market because that's, that's genuinely what it's going to be, even though it's a social mm -hmm. issue, uh, social topic play. Uh, you do market it when the script gets out to other people to produce. Mm -hmm. But marketing it to, does your community theater have a lot of children? Mm -hmm. Here's a show that's a serious topic that children can do. Uh, and saying to colleges that are interested in it, do you have a large undergraduate program? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you either don't have an MFA program or your MFA program produces all these shows that are for actors in their 30s and 40s, but you have undergraduates who are 18 to 21. Mm -hmm. Here is a show for your undergraduates to do. Yeah, or even like, I mean, we both went to Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. which um, I think this is why we have a real interest in social issues. Yeah. Is that was a big chunk of our theater education. But I did a program called VTOPS Encores. I don't know if it's there anymore, but I mm -hmm. remember doing it where I actually had to be a theater student and then go do theater with kids after school. So we did music and theater stuff, which was really fun. Um, and, and also you got punch and cookies, which was also <laughs> really fun, <laughs> but it was an after school arts program. And, um, I actually got cast in one show <laughs> the whole time I was at school and I turned it down so I could do this program. Mm -hmm. That's how much I believe in children are the future. Um, but I think that you could even have in a place like where we were, like Blacksburg, I think has a very small and close knit theater community. And a lot of times, like, I, I'll tell God, I wish I knew what so-and-so was doing, but I also think it's super creepy as me as a 40-year-old being like, well, what is this 18-year-old doing? So I always wait, and, like, if the kid wants me to be involved, I would gladly make sure that they're okay and give them cool aunt advice. But if not, I'm just like, I will just wonder. And mm -hmm. <laughs> that, is, that is fine. They're living their own life. But I do feel like you could have a mentorship type of program between a local high school and our college age kids mm -hmm. that would maybe put the show on together. We also had like um, a ton of high school kids that were very talented and would come do our black box shows. Yeah. So it's not as if there wasn't room for that in many um, mm -hmm. college theater programs. And it's kind of like a nice way to like, like prep the people who are coming into the college yeah. or I don't have enough opportunity to do what I want to do in the high school level. And right. Yeah. So I, I think it's a show with a lot of, I think it's a show that's a very important topic, first and foremost. And I think it's a show with a lot of value for taking it into the community and finding young actors to do this with, like you said, young people who will then, in a few short years, be people who can actually, like, affect change. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it already. Like, I mean, this is what we see a lot of the protests, like after the school shootings, mm -hmm. um, environmental change, like there's a lot of those environmental yeah. protests, um, Black Lives Matter. I think that, like, there are people who are already doing this stuff. It's just, um, I don't think there's a lot of opportunities or people to really kind of give them that push. I mean, there's always a few students who kind of make things happen. Uh, me and Glenn were both those types of students at mm -hmm. Virginia Tech where we want to do our own work but I also feel like you know sometimes you need to maybe mentor guide students in a way because they're just learning how to write they know these things are important but it's sometimes really kind of hard and so being able to kind of like foster a collaborative piece would be really important and it's it's just like what I just think is so striking is you just hear these things like 
you know, I'm 14 and um, there's no parents with us. So I'm changing the two-year-old's diaper, but there's no yeah. new diaper. So I have to figure out what a diaper is. And this little kid is bleeding and he's crying and I, I have to go like give him my blanket because he cold. Like, I mean, it's, it's things that I, I would only assume mm. happened in like Holocaust concentration camp. Like it's just yeah. horrific. And I feel that, you know, we we have been fortunate enough and I think a lot of like maybe the teenagers in our community have been fortunate enough that they've never had to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, may, maybe some folks have, but I feel like it, it helps breed that level of empathy. I help, I think that it helps uh, get people how to understand, uh, you know, newsworthy material and mm -hmm. credible sources versus deep fakes. And I think it like really helps people to, to do things that matter to them. And it's not saying like the songs can't be catchy or the monologues or the story can't be good or anything, but I just feel like you want to give folks an opportunity to grow who they are and where they are and talk about things that are important to them. And I think that, you know, as somebody who's cared for kids for a long time, like it, it, it was really like crisis-y mm -hmm. <laughs> when a lot of this past four years happened. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, not to kind of give too much weight, but this is kind of why I started therapy this year was, you know, I just thought, you know, if, if I find this valuable, why am I not quitting my job and like, going to, you know, Texas, you know, why am I not quitting my job and going to go protest, you know, and, and it made me really kind of sit here and be like, you know, I'm, I'm a hypocrite, like, I'm not helping the people who I, I say that I want to help. And I think that as I'm kind of going through stuff, it's like, I got a lot of my own stuff to go through. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm more important. But for me, I had to just say, like, look, it's for me, it is putting on my oxygen mask before helping other people with theirs. And maybe the way I can contribute is by creating theater like this and helping to involve more people and to build communities and to start shifting mindsets about stuff and making things have a human face. Well, and I've got to say, um, it's very difficult to look at a situation that is this severe and this troubling and like you said be like why aren't i dropping everything and heading down there and standing outside the gates screaming at people that you know these kids need to be released sort of thing um at the same time i can think of <sighs> i don't like to think of it this long ago but 12 16 years ago with uh the first bush administration mm -hmm having one of the people who was instrumental in this sort of um, renegade social topics theater in the 60s and 70s come to speak at the college I was at and having, you know, the kids in that group, the, uh, the undergraduates in that school, saying to them, well what are we supposed to do about this? What, what do you see that we should be doing for this? And her responding, well, we're all waiting for you to do it. You know, we made our path and uh, we're waiting to see you pick up and do your path now because like, we're not going to be here forever. We can't keep doing this forever. You've got to like pick up and do it. And I was like, well, yeah, but you know, like we discussed in our last show, mm -hmm. Um, the opportunities to do what people did when they were protesting in the 60s and 70s have shrunk in the modern age. Well, so much has been put in place that is designed to keep you trapped where you are. Well, I think that, um, now, now if you're out there, Glenn's mother said something very smart about this. <laughs> <laughs> Where... You know, people's lives weren't ruined from one thing. Mm -hmm. And this is not cancel culture. We're not talking about that. But there does seem to be this attitude of, mm -hmm. like, we just saw it happen with the Georgia student who took a picture and said, my halls are crowded. Yeah. Like, this is not not good. Yeah. And then when they said, oh, never mind, we reversed the suspension. And we're really hoping that this doesn't affect you negatively. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, like, well, I'm not the one who put all these kids in the hall. Right. It's, it's very much, I think, adults in institutions of power, whether that's mm. educational or whether that's, um, 
in jobs. And this is like completely yeah. different than like legitimate things of hate and racism. Mm -hmm. This is kids who want to stick up, up and out yeah. for themselves. And people like to say that there's these false equivalencies of like, well, you're a truant because you went to go speak out about the environment and people stop shooting you. And I think a lot of kids are really scared because especially yeah. smart kids see this is my mm -hmm. way to make money and have a job. And if I just put my head down and I just move forward, I can just go mm -hmm. ahead and then pull my, my family up in the world. And I yeah. think that that's what's really uh, damaging and hurtful. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is it is it is a situation that in in my experience from my perspective is getting worse and I can't imagine being a kid and having these feelings now. And by kid I mean anybody under the age of say 25 because that's who feels like a kid to me these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, Well, your brain doesn't stop developing until 25, yeah. so that's fair. But, but even even people our age, I think, we've grown up in this system that was designed to prevent us from being the firebrands that earlier generations were. Because for our for our age, when we were in our early to mid twenties, a lot of the pressures that held us in place that kept us from being like, I'm gonna go camp out on the National Mall for two months to protest this, that, or the other. Um, a lot of those things were economic pressures. They were things of like, well, I can't leave this because if I leave this, X will happen, Y will happen, and I won't have anything to come back to once well, this is all over. Yeah, I was like, or even blended with kind of like the academic yeah. thing as well. Yeah. Okay, they're going to fail me in this class. I just spent $3,000 on it, and yeah. I need that class to graduate, and I'm going to have to stay here next year. Yeah, I have... I already have X amount of dollars in student loans if I wind up dropping out of college because I took a semester, basically a semester, and went out and protested instead of going to class. I still have those student loans. So I might as well stay here and finish my education because I have too much to lose at this point. And each school is different. Like, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is like there yeah. were some schools that would say, sure, go ahead and come back in a year and finish your degree. Yeah. I I tried to go back and see like now that I'm, I'm here at my institution yeah. that I took classes at. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, by the way, I took classes here 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Can I use them? They're like, nope, they're all worthless. Yeah. And they then, don't mean anything anymore. And then in addition, like Rhi was talking about uh, and like my mother likes to talk about. Um, the idea of we were the generation, we were really the first generation to grow up with the idea of um, this could potentially end your life. Mm -hmm. We were the first ones to grow up with like zero tolerance policies and minors being tried as adults. Well, things. I'll even be honest, like mm -hmm. there was something that came up recently on yeah. Twitter where it was, well, I don't take a, a medical doctor seriously if I see them in a bikini and vacation photos. Right, yeah. Things like that are uh, help to keep down people who might be protesting, mm -hmm. uh, and which I have, I actually have a video that addresses that topic coming up for the film Optimist. Hey! Um, Synergy! But, and you have uh, things like, now it's gotten to a point where you can look into any comment on Black Lives Matter or related protests mm -hmm. where you have police officers beating, seriously injuring, or you have these unidentified federal officers disappearing people off the street. And you look in the comments and you will find tons of people being like, well, they shouldn't have splattered red paint on the on the building, or should they? they shouldn't have been there, period. Right, and and they're like, it's like, I'm sorry, but vandalism is not a death penalty crime. Or, it shouldn't be. You, you spray painted a word on a wall, or you were out after curfew, so that gives us every right to use potentially lethal force against you. Yeah, or I mean, like, um, it's it was a saying, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that we need to divide these populations, but there's people who are like, I was trying to get home. Yeah. And I was arrested because they're like, well, you're out on the street. Yeah. And, and it is, you know, it, it's that culture of zero tolerance policies that we grew up under 
is being taken now to a logical extreme of any infraction gives any enforcement who sees you full cause to treat you as though you are a violent felon. Well, you've been applying for mm -hmm. a lot of jobs. And yeah. how many job applications are on there that say, yeah. have you ever been to jail? They don't yeah. even care what it is. Like, I mean, even if well, it's like, I forgot to pay my traffic ticket and I you know, paid it, but I did have to spend some time in jail. Like, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who get so many job applications yeah. that just by saying yes and being honest, they're like immediately in the trash. Yeah. Well, and uh, in Illinois... Uh, there's a story just this past week of the, you know, when I mentioned the splattering red paint, this was probably the thing that was in my mind. Uh, the protesters who were at a protest where several thousand dollars in property damage was done and red paint was splattered all over the front of a public building. And the people, a lot of people were arrested who allegedly were involved in that incident, allegedly were involved in the property damage. Um, again, no no real knowledge on my part as to whether they were actually there or if any of them were innocent and picked up or anything like that. But Illinois, the state of Illinois has now announced that they will be charging them with felony mischief, which takes their offense, which should just be like damage to public property, it takes that offense and turns it into a felony charge that carries a potential life sentence. And it's like, so you're you're picking these people up because of paint on a building and saying you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. That makes no sense to me. But anyway, this yes. is why I think kids should create this yes. piece with me. And I think get them started in social justice musical theater while they're young. Yes. Because there's a wonderful story tradition with Oscars and Oscar mm -hmm. and Hammerstein and uh, Richard Rogers. And um, I just think that that's, well, that's what I really believe musical theater is for. Yeah. I think that, you know, we have not had a great protest song musical. I think it's time to get it started. I think it's time to start with children are our future. Yeah, and the cho the children, like you say, the children are the future, and I think from our perspective as older people, it would be a good idea to start talking to children about this kind of work, mm -hmm. and being like, you have to realize that this world that you're in right now, we didn't grow up in this. Mm -hmm. We grew up. We grew up. This was just starting to form you've only experienced this world. It doesn't have to be like this. Well, and I think, um, you know, I, I saw a very sad social media post from um, somebody on Facebook that I follow, and I used to work with them. But um, they, they were walking with their family along mm -hmm. a trail, and somebody wrote some some words mm -hmm. <laughs> in, a, in a post that was essentially, you know, um, defund the police, Black Lives Matter, blah, blah, blah. And they, they said very disappointingly, like, I hate that I have to have a conversation with my seven-year-old about politics. And I was just like, but they, they already know. Like, I mean, like, I, as somebody who's worked with seven-year-olds, it's very hard to hide the truth from kids. And yeah. I think as much as we love our kids and we want to shelter them and protect them, I think that, you know, some of the stories that has most inspired us as two anxiety-riddled children who love to read mm -hmm. were the ones that gave the kids the tools to fight the monsters and the dragons. And I think that if you can kind of, I, I don't even think it's a hard thing to explain. It's yeah. not like you saw a penis carved in somewhere. <laughs> and even that, that's biology. Yes. But I, I mean... Granted, I'm not a parent, so, you know, I, I, I accept your hate of not raising kids. You could just say, well, it is hard, and you don't know, and uh, I just have to explain it to a five-pound fluffy cat, and she just yes. doesn't care if it's not food. Um, yeah. But I think that it would be very easy to sit there and say, look, there are some people who are very upset, and, um, you know, this is what, what they believe, and this is what the history is, and, you know, I think that, you know, you're going to have to kind of make your own decision on what to say, but just know, like, you're safe, and we're mm -hmm. here to protect you. But, I mean, to sit there and say, like, well, I don't want to explain slavery and policing and all that stuff in Virginia. Like, I mean, they're going to learn about it eventually. And I feel like as a parent, I would much prefer um, focusing the message. Like, yeah. I would want to tell my kids stuff more than I want anybody else to tell my kids stuff, well, even if it's hard. And there's a nice thing about kids is that they've got a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, again, like Bree said, I, you know, we are not parents we don't have kids of our own so 
I understand if there's a parent out there who's like, well, you guys don't just don't uh, understand yeah. what it's like to have these serious conversations That's with true. your kids. It's like, but you can break things down. You can start with the simple, like Bree said, you can, you can, you don't have to go. All right. So let's begin with the European slave trade. <laughs> you don't have to get into the massive details of it all. You can just begin with, there are some people who are very upset mm -hmm. and they're very upset because they feel they're not being treated right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the kid's going to have questions about why do they feel they're not being treated right? Mm -hmm. What's being done to them? But you have time for those conversations and you can get as in-depth as you need to for your kid's age. Yep. And now eventually you may want to get to Okay, so we're going all the way back to the three-fifths compromise and the fact that this country for a long time didn't recognize that black people were people legally. Uh, but you've got time to get to that level of the topic. Yeah. And you've got time to figure out how you're going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah I, I just feel it's like I feel like you need to know your kid. I feel like you need to know what they can handle. You need to know what can make them feel safe. But I also feel like it's, it's, it is unfair to say, well, that doesn't mean anything or we're not going to talk about that today or some stupid people vandalize stuff or whatever. Like that's not really helpful because I feel like this is when, you know, the kid is 10, 11, 12 years older Mm -hmm. that they're kind of getting to the point of like, well, my parents said it didn't matter because like, like the great Stephen Sondheim says and into the woods, children will listen. Children will listen. <laughs> <laughs> and got to be carefully taught from Rogers and Hammerstein. So I'm just saying, right. I think things matter. And I think that if you do have curious kids yeah. and you want them to develop empathy for the experiences of other people and to feel like they have control or over creating safety in the world, not only for mm -hmm. themselves, but for their friends. Yay mm -hmm. theater. <laughs> well, and here is why I had such a big reaction when Bree mentioned, and you've got to be carefully taught is because my introduction to both of those songs is Mandy Patinkin recorded a medley of those two songs. You've got to be carefully taught leading into Children Will Listen as part of his album Oscar and Steven. Listen to Uncle Mandy, kids. Yes. I'm, I'm, Find the Six-Fingered Man. Yes. <laughs> Find the Six-Fingered Man. <laughs> well we love you all thank you so much and have a plan for after vengeance <laughs> this was a very serious topic yes. um we'd love to hear your ideas if mm -hmm. you do work in kids theater you think that this would be great we'd love to work with you like yeah. this is my wheelhouse man i was like mm -hmm. i think you know i don't like to talk about many of my my projects on here because i feel like there's that serotonin rush where yeah. it's like i did it i told everybody and it's just as good as doing it like my brain gets that nice nice brain candy mm -hmm. But I really feel like this is something that's going to be really important. And I think that sometimes it's really hard for me to deal with stuff like as they're happening. I wish it could be a bit faster on that. I would have like a job with Law & Order right away. But <laughs> I, I think thinking about it, and I think that there's a lot of topics and issues that I like to ruminate on and to bounce it off friends and family. So I think this is something that might come up later in my work. And if you want to develop it now, like... Hey, I'm available. Yeah. I'd love to do it with you. I think it's important, and um, I'd love to see something come of it. So, all right. Well, thank you for tuning in. That I think that was a phenomenal uh, pitch, a phenomenal idea. I'd like to see it done. I'd like to see her doing it. <laughs> Anybody out there with money or a theater or both who wants to like hire this woman? <laughs> there are people out here who want to see her doing stuff. So. Well, I'm going to leave you guys with one more thought because mm. if you're not already frustrated enough with this idea, I asked Glenn this the other day because I've been listening to the, um, it's Wired and it's like the five levels of teaching people stuff. And one was, um, do you believe if somebody could take your brain and put it into a computer, is that really you? Why aren't, why not tweet at me? That's another topic I'd love to do. I'm really interested. I love neuroscience. Let me know. Why is your brain a computer, you or not you? Mm. 
I know his answer. <laughs> yeah, she, she heard my like hour long lecture on this that started with, well, this is one of the classic themes of science fiction. <laughs> I also I, have like very interesting thoughts about antigens and blood. And yeah. if you could cure COVID with your blood right now, what might happen legally? Yeah. If you say yes or if you say no. I'm thinking of dystopian movies around the world, children. <laughs> this is the level of pandemic we're at. But we love you. We miss you. Thanks for joining in mm -hmm. on this Wednesday evening. We hope that you get your hot cocoa or your warm milk and snuggle mm -hmm. in and get cuddly and uh, have sweet dreams of social justice. Yes, if you're if you're in Central Virginia, stay home. Don't move unless somebody tells you to evacuate because of the weather situation, and just in general because of the situation. Uh, stay home. Keep social distance. Wear your mask if you've got to go out. Take care of yourself. All right, because we love you, and we're not there to take care of you. Bye, guys. <laughs>